Good morning and welcome to today's Insight Seminar Series. My name is Cameron from Dovetail. I'm going to be your host today. Uh, before we kick off, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, this morning we've got Dr. Akashole with us. He's presenting on a very fascinating topic, understanding the complex relationship between substance use disorders, mental health, family, community and culture. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Akashole. For those online, uh, type your questions throughout the presentation and we'll get some time to get to those uh, at the end. So over to you, Dr. Akashole. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you all for the opportunity of um, presenting um, at Insight. I remember training and attending some of the um, Insight um, lectures and they're quite um, informative, yes. I, today's topic um, is quite broad and complex so because we're looking at several themes within it which is um, culture, family, substance use, early development, and non-substance use psychiatric diagnosis. If we're starting with culture, uh, in preparing for this topic, I thought it would be a straightforward thing to define, um, and it's not. It's, it's, a, it's quite difficult to define culture uh, when we use it very loosely. Um, and in fact, the anthropologists Krober and um, Clockhorn, after reviewing concepts and definitions of um, culture had compiled over 164 different definitions. And um, apt writing in the Encyclopedia of Language and li Linguistics summarized the problems by saying, despite a century of efforts to define culture, as at the early 60s there was no agreement amongst anthropologists regarding its nature. Finally, I, the definition that I felt, um, well, satisfied what I conceptualized as culture was um, from Helen, who's a professor of social anthropology from the University of Huawei. She defined culture as a fuzzy set of basic assumptions and values, orientation to life, beliefs, policies, procedures, and behavioral conventions that are shared by a group of people and that influence but do not determine each member's behavior. Please note that it could influence but does not necessarily determine each member's behavior. And his or our interpretation of the meaning of the other people's behavior. So that was um, the closest, I mean, I thought encapsulated all the other definitions. So, you know, if we're going on to culture, it's dynamic and leaders, you know, I mean, I mean, the, the topic is not only on culture because um, people, a movement changes culture, you know, but I think leaders play a very significant role in changing culture. And leaders are actually a product of their society. Leadership influences culture and, cultu and culture influences leaders. So in terms of mental health, what is the attitude of popular world leaders towards mental health? I think we'll start with 1940, 1939 to 1945. Um, that is the highest psychiatric genocide on record, um, with, the Naz with Nazi Germany trying to eradicate schizophrenia. And at the time, it was said that between 220,000 to 269,000 individuals were either sterilized or killed at the time. Yes, the... Um, the prevalence rate of schizophrenia reduced um, after the World War, but the incidence actually went up. So, um, but I think it's important to, to see how a leader's view of psychological health issues could actually be systematically used to, um, you know, persecute people living with psychological illness. It's still happening today. I mean, uh, Duarte's war on um, drugs has claimed over 12,000 lives in the Philippines. Yeah. So, and as we know, the war targets people living with substance use disorder. The real people who, because there's a role law enforcement plays in 
you know, I mean, also reducing substances so that, but it has to target criminals, people who are actually wholesale selling and distributing, not people who are using at the, at, at the lower end. And then um, Donald Trump, um, when recently, it was 2018, was talking to veterans, he said, when you talk about the mental health problems, when people come back from war and combat, they see things that maybe a lot of folks in this room have seen many times over. And you are strong, you can handle it, but a lot of people can't handle it. I mean, within the context of the statement, it's not true that we see what veterans see during war. I mean, is that, is that true? I mean, so, you know, and, and then the, the issue of them not being able to handle it, like there's an inherent weakness in people who are living with psychological health issues. And, and this is not, um, this all, my talk today is based a lot on research. It's not an opinion or it's not f philosophical. So, but because I think it's important to understand that leaders actually shape how we see people living with psychological health issues. So is mental health a weakness? Is it suffered by people who are weak? We know that this is a kind of a popular narrative. It's changing in Australia, it's changing in the UK, it's changing around the world, so which is very good. And stigma continues to be a, a significant issue. So, I mean, if, if there's a psychological illness in which, the, in which society knows a lot about, I think it will be depression. I think people are now more accepting that, yes, I mean, one in five, the prevalence, lifetime prevalence rate and all that. But this study that was done, a survey in, in Canada, it, it still shows that there's still significant stigma um, associated with even having a diagnosis of depression. Um, and the outcome is that mental health is still viewed as a sign of weakness. And this survey was done in um, about 10,000. It was a well represent, rep uh, um, representative sample of Canadians. And other perceptions, they commit the worst crimes, they're bludgers, uh, they waste our hard-earned tax dollars. Um, and these narratives are not new, and they're accompanied with devaluation and discrimination. Um, Again, we remember the Las Vegas shooter, and um, may the souls of the individual rest, uh, of the people who died um, as a result of his action rest in peace. But it, it, the next thing is to not talk about gun control, not talk about you know all the other issues, but to quickly say is because he's psychologically uh, he has a psychological illness. It's not the guns; it's um, the person who's um, you know, carrying the gun. And in Australia, um, uh, Dan Tehan was our social services minister a year ago, and um, drug and alcohol abusers faced tighter pension tests. And he was replaced by Anne Rushton. And raising new start will give drug dealers more money. <laughs> You know, I mean, if they say this publicly, I wonder what happens behind closed doors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and the same thing, stigma in, in terms of, um, okay, look, in linking it to that, you want them to go back to work. But the reality is that who's going to employ them? And that's what we're saying. There's still stigma even in the labor market, which is very difficult to prove. Very, very difficult to prove. So these guys set up fictitious um, CVs and including, in, included within the CV is just a history of living with a psychological health issue, but in, in remission, I'm doing well now. And they sent out, well, you know, the same very similar profile, similar degrees, and it was sent out. So the result, the study involves sending fictitious applications to job listings, and in line with the research, indicating that mental illness leads to stigma there were significantly fewer callbacks to candidates with mental illness. There were significantly lower likelihood of callback if the job involves interpersonal contact. So one of the things our clients suffer from is that social distance. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, and, and we know how 
um, significant that is and how much it's linked to actually uh, a very negative outcome, outcome such as suicide, such that there was a commission of loneliness, isn't it, appointed in the UK. Yeah, that's how significant social distance. And so this, so when I'm saying that it's not a soapbox, these are things backed by research. It's not my philosophical leaning or is countries who are thinking about it in a more sophisticated manner realize how much it's costing the economy and you know and in fact the OECD sees psychological health as the biggest uh, problem in terms of reduction in GDP so people are beginning to think about it in a more sophisticated manner yeah and I think we should be aware of this and should also lead this change and so the issue is, is addiction and mental illness? Yes, it is. Um, actually, substance use disorder is a chronic relapsing brain disease that is characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use despite harmful consequences. This definition is by NIDA. It is considered a brain disease because drugs actually change the brain. They change its structure. They change how it works. They actually target something that is integral to all of us, which is pleasure because they target the pleasure pathways in the brain. Most of the things we do in life is tied to pleasure, whether it's being a psychiatrist or being a, a, a counselor, a father. Honestly, it all kinds of end up in that pathway. And that's why when someone has a substance use disorder, the social consequences, the wide-reaching effects are so profound because it's taking over an integral part of who we are. So it's a chronic is a chronic complex medical illness with significant social consequences and individuals with substance use disorder mostly have a coexisting non-substance use disorder. I think we, we, we all know this about co-occurring um, psychiatric illnesses and um, comorbidity research. But do labels matter? Because there's that drive and there's that, uh, you know, um, the DSM has tried to change it to substance use disorder, ICD, it's still dependence, addiction, you know, and, and those terms, do they really matter? Look, they do. They do, um, unfortunately. And, and those who know that these things matter, like people who create brands, they spend millions in researching about names, about branding, because they know it matters. Whoever tells you it doesn't is, is not being truthful. It does. These guys spend millions, I mean, you know, to, to make sure they're getting the right name. And there's a lot of research about that. So they know that good labels have two syllables or less, and they usually have a strong sound like K or X, so that it sticks in your mind, you know. And, uh, you know, so brand names, all those things, they, they do matter. Like Nike would have been called Dimension 6. I mean, <laughs> compare it. <laughs> I know Pepsi Cola was called Brad's drink. I mean, <laughs> you know, so there, there is a lot of research around. So don't let no one tell you that those things don't matter. They do, and um, so I, and I think that shift, that change, I think we should embrace it and stop using those terms. And you know, and, and it reduces the stigma, it reduces the social distance, it, and allows them to see it first as a medical problem. We're not running away from the social consequences. We're not running away from the fact that the individual needs to make changes and drive those changes. I mean, that's the, what the recovery model is about, and it's a shared clinical decision between them and their clinicians. So, I mean, the same thing, there's, there's a lot of link between mental illness and dangerousness, and we've talked about the social distance. And there's that causal attribution to, um, you know, that the person is likely dangerous, which sometimes is the case if they're high, if they're very psychotic. But most of the time, that's not that is not true, isn't it? I mean, I, I couldn't get a proper research, but I think we know that people are safer in a bar than on a psychiatric. We are safer on a psychiatric ward than in a bar. Yeah, I mean, that's that's something that. Well, I think it's hard to say, but to say that without proper research. But if we look at the statistics loosely, that's the case. And the power of language. So this was an interesting study that had undergraduate students, um, adults in the community, and actually trained counselors. And, and they were given a measure of tolerance. And they, they noted that when they used the word mentally ill, 
as opposed to people living with mental illness, professional counselors had the largest difference in tolerance on the basis of language. Professional counselors. So I think, I'm not sure if over time we become desensitized. And, and, and sometimes, I guess, the client uses the language themselves. And you know, for us to kind of get that rapport, we use their language. But I think we should lead that change. So they're living with a mental illness. They are not mentally ill. And we are not immune to the bias ourselves. So those with non-substance use psychiatric diagnosis um, suffered less discrimination compared to those who had substance use disorder. So the study, it's important to realize that in the field of substance use disorder, they suffer the worst discrimination. Yeah. So, I mean, people living with just whether it's um, depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or some form of personality disorder, is those who have a substance use disorder that suffer the worst um, stigma and discrimination because people think it's their fault. Now, this, in fairness, I mean, the NHS leads a lot of... Um, it changes in terms of um, health and systemic changes around the world. But this study in, um, I think it was 2014 or so, showed shocking discrimination against mental illness within the NHS. And I think it's something that we are aware of in most systems around the world. That is, you know, the, the way psychiatry and substance use disorder is treated is, or the priority is given, is much lower down until recently. And even when it's given priority, it's more of law enforcement and there, there are other, uh, or it, it awaits a sentinel event before something is really done. But looking at this, um, it was led by Lord Lehard and, um, and the London School of Economics. This was their conclusion. NHS is, is England was guilty of injustice in its treatment of people with mental illness they found that those, le those who are age 65, nearly half of them, um, nearly half of all ill health was mental illness. Six million people had depression or anxiety conditions, and yet three quarters got no treatment. I think that would be people with anxiety, depression, we hardly see them, yeah, in the public mental health service. So who's seeing them? And mental health is so central to the health of individuals and, and of society that it needs its own cabinet minister. So this was after this that they had a cabinet minister in mental, in, in, for, um, for mental health. So the NHS managers, other observations, failed to commission properly the mental health services recommended in the official guidance. 400 million pounds earmarked by the government for psychological therapy was not always used for its intended purpose. As we know, there would always be a clause because there was no obligation on the manager to do so. The committee concluded that mental health services should be expanded, but if anything, it was being cut drastically. Is this familiar? I think we're, the changes are happening here, isn't it? For good, I, I think. There's a Mental Health Royal Commission going on in Victoria at the moment. And, um, you know, I mean, there's just, um, in the recent elections, mental health has become a topic. I mean, so I think we should be fair in saying that they, they're also um, improving. Is, is that fair? Yeah, I think so. Comorbidity is rife. And um, I think this is a familiar slide. Um, I think I, I got this slide from Mark Daglish. So, and we, we can see they have higher rates of HIV and HCV accommodation problems, increased criminal activity, fewer so social supports. I think we're aware of all of this. In increased relapse rate, unemployment, um, and particularly when they have co-occurring illnesses. And from the US, this results from multiple surveys have shown that persons diagnosed with mood or anxiety disorder are about twice as likely to suffer also from drug use disorder. So I think it's a time when anyone working in the field must have skills 
to treat both illnesses. Whether it's basic or brief intervention, motivational interviewing, and I think, unfortunately, insight has to lead the drive to educate everybody across board because it's just so high. I mean, in schizophrenia, 90% of them smoke cigarettes, for example, I mean, uh, uh, nicotine. So it's really high. And it goes both ways. Similarly, persons diagnosed with drug disorders are roughly twice as likely to suffer from mood and anxiety disorders. And, uh, and I was just talking about smoking and mental health. I mean, that's the last frontier, for example, in Australia that has had a whole um, you know, raft of packages to, to deal with, um, uh, what do you call it, um, to bring down the rates of um, tobacco use, yeah. But I was just listening on the radio, the costs, which no one knew. They were sued by the tobacco companies, and they had to pay a lot of money for suddenly changing because it, it was against um, the, the trade agreement. Millions, yes, yeah, so the government lost millions over this, this change. So, um, so I think in summary, 56% of psychiatry inpatients are using alcohol or drugs problematically. Nearly half of the people suffering from schizophrenia also present with a, present with a lifetime history of substance use disorder. 60 to 90% of people with schizophrenia smoke cigarettes. 40 to 60 misuse other substances. Individuals with mood disorders have a lifetime prevalence of 32% um, for substance use disorder. Individuals with bipolar disorder have a lifetime prevalence of 56%, which is twice more than um, depression. And generalized anxiety, which we all miss, they have a 21% um, rate of substance use disorder. So the higher prevalence of comorbidity between drug use disorder and other mental illnesses does not mean that one costs the other. So I think in terms of causality or the direction of it is hard to, to establish. The other issue is subclinical symptoms may also prompt drug use. And imperfect recollection of when drug use or abuse started can create confusion as to what started first. So, and I guess the point of this slide is this treatment in silos, uh, it really can't work. You know, I mean, you have to have clinicians who are able to manage both in a sense, you know, because it's, it's hard to say what started first, yeah. Because sometimes the subclinical symptoms can be as much as just living in a, in a household with an unpredictable parent. And the child has increased anxiety and hyperarousal levels. And from then just started smoking a bit of cannabis. And that's how that relationship starts. So it's not important what started first or what the diagnosis is. It's just important that we have clinicians who are able to manage both. And I guess the theories around it is that drugs of abuse can cause abusers to experience one or more mental health concern and increase the risk of psychosis, for example, cannabis. The other was what I was just explaining about subclinical um, that is subclinical symptoms leading to increasing substance use. The thought is that both drug use disorders and mental illness are caused by overlapping factors which can be both underlying brain deficits, genetic vulnerability, or early exposure to stress or trauma. So um, overlapping genetic vulnerability, 40 to 60 percent of an individual's vulnerability to addiction is attributed to genetics. And um, you know, several regions of the human genome have been linked to increased risk of both drug use disorder and mental illness. Involvement of similar brain areas. Um, you know, the dopamine pleasure pathways are both affected by both illnesses. And the influence of the developmental stage of adolescence. And I think we know more now that the brain is still developing till 25, 30 and that early introduction to substance use actually affects the reward pathway in the brain, and that's very important for a growing child. So uh, the problems that are associated with dual diagnosis, um, you know, is either underdiagnosed, unrecognized, um, they are treated in different services with 
distinct cultures that is changing um, and there are poor outcomes due to medication compliance and poor response to medications and higher rates of relapse um, and they experience poorer socioeconomic derivatives such as violence, hospital admissions, incarceration and homelessness and they have higher rates of suicide. Now, I think we'll quickly shift to family and early development. So that's um, Gulf Whitlam's family. We all come from families, no matter. <laughs> um, and that's um, Mandela, and that's the first prime minister of India, Nehru. So um, social learning is the most common way people learn. Um, children and adolescents, they learn alcohol-related behaviors from the modeling of their parents and, and important others in their life. The social interactions that we have, the greatest influence on our lives are the people who matter to us when we're growing up. This is very important, and that's what we call imprinting, and those relationships continue to be replicated until you have, until you see a therapist, if particularly if they're unhe unhealthy, or a priest or something, or you read a book that changes or gives you insight into it. <laughs> the brain continues to grow and there's a lot of research about that and I think we're not talking about it enough um, the fact that this is a critical part of an adolescent's brain and is still a work in progress puts them at risk of poor decision such as trying drugs or continuing abuse us introducing drugs while the brain is still developing may have profound and long-lasting consequences and I think we're beginning to see that now there's a lot of research in this area from the United States yeah that early introduction to drug use is catastrophic in a sense it is particularly in significant amounts and particularly if it's to solve subclinical um, psychiatric symptoms so I think in terms of psychoeducation, in terms of we, we need to do more to prevent people having a lifetime of psychological health issues. Having a mental disorder in childhood or adolescence actually increases the risk of substance use disorder. So conduct disorder, untreated attention deficit, uh, hyperactive disorder are two of those disorders in childhood associated with significant mental health problems of substance use disorder. A lot of research from Netherlands showing this, unfortunately. So that's why a lot of people who were missed in terms of treatment of ADHD in childhood, they, they still have the inattention and they still have the emotional dysregulation into adulthood and at risk of substance use disorder, which will end up not getting them treated because if they're already taking amphetamines, you wouldn't want to prescribe stimulants to them and very high comorbidities, and they've done actually longitudinal studies to, to, to show this, yes. So treating children with ADHD can be challenging, I mean, since the effective treatments are stimulants, or, or, or even adults. So then association between family history of substance use disorder, childhood trauma, and age of first drug use in persons with methamphetamine dependence. So, I mean, this, this study found that um, pe people with family history of substance use disorder, early childhood trauma, had obviously a much younger age of onset of uh, methamphetamine use disorder. Early life stress plays quite a significant role in the development of um, ongoing psychological health issues. You know, so early life stress can predict the development of psychopathology in adults, aggravate, maintain reoccurrence of psychiatric disorders. And we already knew this in public health research, that those first five years actually determines how long the individual would live, isn't, isn't it? You know, I mean, so people who had significant socioeconomic dep deprivation, whether it's in terms of their nutrition, you know, um, and several um, infections as a child and, and all that, even if they come into wealth in their 20s or 30s, 
their length of life is determined by those early experiences. That's one of the biggest predictors. Um, you can go and fact check this. I mean, it's, it's quite well known. And it's the same with psychological health issues, you know. So the way forward, I mean, we've raised a number of issues. So we've talked about early introduction to substance use disorder, the role of family, the role of society, our role as mental health workers in, in leading the change. We've also talked about labels and how it's important to change that. We've also talked about these are people who are caught between a, a rock and a hard place. So you want them to go back to work, but they can't get jobs. At the same time, you don't want to increase their pension because you think they will give it to drug dealers or not spend it appropriately. So some of the things is that um, government-sponsored relationship counseling, when two adults have chosen to be partnered or decide to have children, I think we need to provide some of these things are subject to, I mean, uh, pe people may disagree, but we need to support families more. Government-sponsored parenting supporting at-risk families and how to identify them. Prenatal screening for mental health issues and substance use disorder with the provision of supports. I think Hicks actually recommended this um, in his paper that that would really help. I mean, I was looking at uh, in a separate presentation the report of the Chief Health Officer of Queensland, and um, more than 33% of women drink alcohol throughout their pregnancy. That is fact. That's from the Chief Health Officer's report. I think um, I, you've read that report, haven't you? Yes. So it, it's it's it, we are not doing enough, and we know fast D is you're just that child is starting a hundred meter race in it at the two hundred meter line, you know. So it, it's not it, he's he's up against it. Targeted public health campaigns educating young people on the need to delay. They need to understand their brain is still developing till they're 25. I think more, more, we need to talk about this more. Reviewing school curri curriculum and, and with implementation, I think this is already going on of teaching and modeling effective coping skills from primary school, Collins et al. This is, I think this is really important. Yeah, in terms of distress tolerance, interpersonal effectiveness, some of those, you know, borrowing a bit from a few schools so that it can help people learn to cope with stress. Other suggestions, tax benefits to companies who hire people living with, with a mental illness or SODs, and some tax breaks. So I think that would help get people into work. An investment in evidence-based rehabilitation services, that's a big, it's a, it's a huge concern, I think. We don't have enough evidence-based rehabilitation services. Health workers, stop the negative labels, speak about SODs as a medical disorder with social consequences, and let us all remember that all medical disorders have social consequences. I mean, in a plane, you want to sit next to a slim person, and look, when, you, when a big guy is sitting next to you in a plane, you don't, or someone is coughing next to you in a plane. You know, I mean, those, those are social consequences. There's, there's a bit of social distance that you want to keep. I mean, you don't want to get the flu, so there are. Or people missing days, at, at work days for, for flu. It's costing the economy a lot of money. So every medical con condition has a social consequence if we really think about it. So culture and mental health is not just about culture-bound syndrome, which is what in the past that's all, um, you know, missing body parts and all that. But I mean, there's no clear documented evidence for, for these things, but it is fine. Um, and it's not about, you know, is anorexia a culture-bound syndrome? Is it only seen in Caucasians or what? I mean, I don't think these things are as important as changing the attitudes to mental illness um, for the better. And I think um, Alistair Campbell has been a great ambassador for that, and I think he, he needs to be commended. Um, he's the former press secretary to um, Tony Blair. Uh, he's an exceptional man in that area, and that's what we want. We want to change those attitudes. We want to change people's perception, and we want to realize. We want the government to realize that it will save them money and it will make the GDP go higher. Thank you.